yard try from the right hash. The wind at his back. He's a right-footed kicker. He kicks from straight behind. He chips it up, and it is good. Fordham retakes the lead, 23-21 center. Clearly the player of the game to come in in this situation. Gets blown off the football. Could it be a fumble? It may be. Bucknell says it is. Oh, it could be disaster. Referee's still working through. Bucknell has the football. And they're going to have to get back to the line of scrimmage. Clock to eight. Wesley under center. Still waiting. Three seconds. And now he spikes the football. Was it a fumble? It was. Unbelievable. He never had the football in his hands. That's what they're saying. And now they're saying it was an incomplete pass. Joan Moorhead is all the way on the hash mark. He can't believe it. To two. They say he did spike it. This will be a 37-yard try for the win to end Fordham's perfect season. The snap is back. The ball is now blocked. It's blocked and recovered by Fordham. The game is over. The most unbelievable finish has occurred at Jack Coffey. Fordham wins 23-21. Unbelievable, Mike. That, that was undescribable. And we welcome you to Monday Night Quarterback here on WFUVsports.org and FordhamSports.com. We've got a great show for you after an excellent win over Bucknell. We're going to have Jordan Chapman on along with Peter Matzelt, who played instrumental roles in this win. We're also going to have Nate Slutsky on to talk about special teams. But first we begin with Fordham football head coach Joe Moorhead. And coach, when you look back at, at the week that was, it was really quite the roller coaster, wasn't it? <laughs> it was quite an adventure. Yeah, well, and just to even begin with this, in the first quarter, the, the senior day ceremony, could you ever have imagined that the, the game would progress the way it did? No, I mean, senior day was tremendous. I mean, for the fact that we had, uh, I believe it was 17 guys playing their uh, last regular season game at home, and uh, just to see how far the program's come in two years, uh, I was very excited for those guys and, you know, for them to have an uh, opportunity to um, – you know, get to 10-0 and, and, and to be undefeated at home in the regular season, I thought it was a, a tremendous day for uh, the players and their families. And so, Coach, one of those guys that was a senior has played a big role for this team this year and last year, Carlton Koontz is able to get a touchdown. How important do you think it was for him to get this touchdown on senior day? No, it, it was great. And, um, you know, Carlton's been an integral part of what we've done as a team and offensively over the past, past two seasons. Uh, you know, reached 1,000 yards rushing again. And, you know, for him to be able to, um, you know, Get close to 100, you know, he, I think he had 84 yards and, and, you know, got some tough yards against a very good run defense and for him to catch the ball and, you know, kind of weave his way into the end zone behind a couple good blocks, it was, uh, it was a great way for him to culminate uh, our, our regular season um, finale. Now, Coach, when you look back really in, in this game, the one thing that really hung over the entire thing was the injury to Michael Niebrick. Had an MRI today and it was deemed – Cautionary. The reason he was out during our broadcast is what we were told. What do you know now? Yeah, I mean, M Michael had an injury to his knee. It wasn't an ACL, so uh, we're happy about that. So, you know, he went and saw the doctors today, had it examined, and um, you know, got it taken care of. So, uh, we, we haven't seen him, um, you know, since since he's been down there. And uh, you know, we're gonna get him back tomorrow, talk to the trainers, and then you know, we'll go day to day from there. And coach, in, in this game, once Michael Niebert goes down, you have to hand the ball over to Peter Matzel, a guy that hasn't seen a lot of action so far this year. How did what did your mindset go to at this point in, in the game? Did your play calling adjust at, at any point with Matzel in there? It didn't adjust at all. And uh, you know, obviously, we were disappointed with Michael going down, particularly with the type of season he's having. It's you know a candidate for the Walter Payton Award, but you know Peter had a tremendous preseason camp. Uh, Coach Bronner does an excellent job preparing him, and you know, and he he um, his number was called. You know, next man in stepped in and you know did as good or as as we say do as good or better job than the guy you're replacing. And you know, I think he threw for close to you know 320 yards and just over three quarters. And you know, I even asked him on the sideline, "Is there anything you're not comfortable with?" And he said, "Just call the game." So, uh, you know, I think that's a credit to him and his preparation. Now, Coach, when you look back at this game, the offense obviously did just enough, but the defense really, I think, played maybe their most sound game of the season. Let's take a look at an Ian Williams interception here and, and just 
to get the turnovers, to get the big plays. What does it mean uh, in the course of this one? No, it was great. Our defense did a tremendous job throughout the day, held the running game in check, you know, gave up some explosive plays on some misdirections and some, uh, you know, trick plays. But, you know, we, we really put our corners on an island. Uh, you know, you see Carlton running in there on, on the uh, pass play we talked about earlier. But with what we did defensively, you know, putting nine men in the box to try to stop the run because they're a run first team. Uh, it, it put our corners out there on an island and asked them to be in man-to-man -man coverage situations throughout the game. And, uh, you know, Ian and Jordan, I think, did a, did a very good job. And, uh, you know, being out there on the island is lonely. So, <laughs> they, um, you know, they, they did a good job. Defense does a good job. Offense does enough for you guys to get the win. You're actually up 23-21, 55 seconds left in the game. And you go in for the kneel down. Yep. And why don't you take us through what you saw on that play? Uh, you know, I, I saw us get knocked off the ball and, and the thing come out and, and Bucknell recover it. So, you know, obviously that's my responsibility. You know, we go through the victory kneel situation every day in our Friday walkthrough. But, you know, I guess um, you know, I didn't do a good enough job preparing our guys for what Bucknell was going to do in uh, terms of um, pushing back the line of scrimmage. So it's my job to put the kids in position to, you know, see the looks during the week and for my job to coach them to, you know, make sure that they play hard on every snap. So Bucknell played hard on us on that snap. Their coaches prepared their guys better, and, uh, you know, that's my responsibility. Now, during the broadcast, we realized that Joe Susan, the head coach for Bucknell, had spent time under Greg Schiano at Rutgers, and, of course, Schiano came under fire in Tampa Bay last year for a very similar situation. Did you guys know that this was a possibility, that they would come out and then maybe try and force a fumble on a play like this? Um, you know, we had, you know, from our time playing uh, Rutgers when I was at UConn, we had seen this. So, uh, um, you know, Coach Briner, our quarterback's coach, brought it up to me right before the, um, the um, play was about to take place, and I mentioned it to the referee on the sideline. But, uh, you know, I have no issue with what they did. I mean, that, to me, they're, they're playing to play hard. They're, they're trying to win the game. And, uh, you know, we've uh, obviously talked about it afterwards, and we're going to make some adjustments to our, our victory set. And, uh, you know, they, um, you know, that's, you know, I've got no issue with that. All right, so let's go through this last drive for Bucknell. 48 seconds, one timeout when yeah. they eventually get the ball. They start having a couple of plays, and then there's one critical play on that drive, a pass interference call against Ian Williams. Sets him up with good position. What did you see on that, that call? Yeah, we're in a uh, you know man-to-man -man situation here, and you see Ian guarding his man as he had the whole week. He got out of the pocket, scrambled, and the ball gets underthrown, and you know they just get tied up, and uh, you know it's – it's unfortunate, you know, that it, it came down to that in that situation. But, uh, you know, that's just what the referee saw. And then they get tangled up, and that thing's going to get called. So they move the ball all the way up to about the 20-yard line, which is in field goal range for the Bucknell kicker, Derek Maurer. They decide they're going to center the football and take a knee around the 20-yard line, setting up what was a very unorthodox spike play. Take me through this. and. I, what did you see from the sideline? You were emphatic that there was an issue in terms of the officiating here. Yeah, I mean, there were two things going on here that I felt were an issue. And, uh, you know, the most important of them being that, you know, I wasn't so sure that the kid had the ball in his hands and actually held possession and threw it down to the, the ground for a spike. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, we shouldn't even have been in that situation because we should have been able to kneel the thing out and, you know, been out of there clean. But, uh you know, you know, we talked to the to the league about it, and you know, we've got it resolved and got answers. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we found a way to make a play at the end with the um, block field goal, and we're fortunate we dodged a bullet. You know, we were fortunate to get out of there with a the win. And let's talk about that. You guys blocked the field goal at the end of the game. You win the game. It was such a hard fought game that that last minute of the game was so crazy with so many twists and turns. What was your emotion running through your head at the end of the game there? Ah, uh, it, it went from you know excitement to the fact that we were in victory formation to take a knee to uh, um, wondering what was going to happen that they had the ball and were they going to drive down the field and then you know the last three play se sequence there was just like you said er earlier as a roller coaster and uh, you know to finish it off with us blocking the field goal in the last play obviously we were excited that you know we were able to win the game and get to 10-0 and, and be undefeated at home but uh, you know certainly that isn't the way you'd like to script it at the end there. Well it wasn't easy but 10-0 is 10-0 so the Rams Able to get the victory, and they'll head on to another Patriot League matchup here with Lafayette coming up on the road this week. We'll preview that later with Coach Joe Moorhead. But first, time to talk X's and O's with a Fordham assistant coach. This week, it's Nate Slutsky joining us. And, Coach, some special teams, some defensive backs. You stay quite busy during, uh, during the week, don't you? 
Absolutely. You know, every single play out there, you know, we got to get a chance to, you know, make a big thing happen for this football team, and we've had a chance to do that. And, Coach, it was obviously a big week for you guys on the special team side of the ball. Offense not able to get a lot of touchdowns, but you were able to get a couple of field goals. Mike Miranda was named the special teams player of the week. Talk about the kind of job that he has done replacing a guy like Patrick Murray from a year ago. Well, actually, last time I was on the show, you guys asked me the same question. We had just beaten Temple, and he had a, a large kick, you know, at the you know at the end to to really put us in a position to win that game. And he's done that again this week, and he's really done that all year. I mean, he's leading the country or near the top of it anyway in field goals. And and uh, you know, our team has confidence that when he goes out there, we're going to have three points. Well, and last time we talked a little bit about some struggles with kick coverage and and being able to maybe get guys down quickly after they bring the ball up. What have you guys done since? And it seems like you've done a better job of limiting returns in this time uh, on kickoff coverage specifically. Well, uh, you know, we uh, started utilizing a freshman, McKay Red, uh, to start kicking off for us. And he's done a nice job putting the ball deep and with good hang. And that certainly helps our units. And then uh, put a couple more starters from our defense onto that unit. And, you know, those guys go down the field and those guys are tougher to block. And, and uh, you know, we've done a good job of you know reading our keys, avoiding the right way, and, and smashing them when we get down there. So it's been good. There was one key special teams play that I noticed, and that was a punt. In the latter stages of this game, you guys are actually able to, punt, uh, to pin Bucknell inside the five-yard line. And uh, a guy, Mark DeSisto, actually is the guy that runs down there and does it. So why don't you take us through that play and talk about some of the, the play that you guys were able to accomplish there. Sure. Well, uh, you know, we're on the plus side of the field, so we're going to be in a pooch situation. So in that situation, both Jordan Chapman and Mark DeSisto are told to run as fast as they can, get their heels to the goal line, and then pin the ball, you know, keep the ball from going over the line while everyone else can go out there and cover it up. Uh, both those guys kind of got held up on the line a little bit, so they weren't as far down the field as you normally would be in a situation like that. Uh, but DeSisto kept on fighting, and, and he got there really just in the nick of time and was able to bat it back, and then he had the awesome Selly right there at the very end. Well, and the Sally might be the most important part, but if it weren't, maybe the punt would be at the top of the list. And the system, of course, being able to get down there, but for Joe Pavlik, a freshman, to be able to come up with a punt and switch field position that late in the game, how important was that kick for him? Well, if you had the other view of that same play, you would see he had just as sweet as a Sally from, from behind, you know, after he kicked it. But, uh, he, um, you know, he's been awesome for us all year. You know, our offense has been cooking the last few weeks, and he hasn't really had a chance to go out there. But... Every time we put him out there, he's, he's made huge kicks. I think he had a career-long 50-some, seven-yard or something like that in this last game earlier, uh, kicking in the same direction. And, you know, when we need him to go out there and make a clutch play, you know, we have faith in him too. I mean, we got great specialists, and he's one of them. Yeah, you talk about the great specialists. One of the guys that's really had an impact on special teams is a younger guy in Jorge Solana in the kickoff return game. And how important has he been for the special teams unit so far this year? I mean, he's great. He's got a ton of confidence, and he's willing to, to, to just – go and hit things, you know, fast and get vertical and, and uh, you know, puncture the kickoff team. And, and uh, he's, he's done that a few times. He got that touchdown against St. Francis. We've gotten balls out past the 50 a few times with him. Uh, we were really one block away from this last one, uh, and we probably could have had another one in this last game. But, you know, we have two more regular season games left. And, and um, you know, our expectation every time that unit takes the field is this thing's going to the house. Well, and Coach, you told us earlier that you guys are maybe putting a few more defensive starters on kick coverage, and it seems like that's a major point of pride for the guys that, you know, they come away with interceptions like Jordan Chapman did, but I think he'd much rather talk about, I, I think, a lot of the special teams plays he had this week. Uh, and really, does it go back to there's a trophy that was introduced. I was there when it came out, uh, a very elaborate introduction for the trophy to the team and a special teams points race that's been going on all year. How much pride does that force these guys to take to try and win a trophy like that? You know, it's it's partially pride, but I think it's really also to have a little bit of fun. I mean, you know, I think sometimes people on on some football teams will look at special teams as a as a chore or a task, and and our guys just don't look at it that way. They look at it as as most importantly a way to win a football game, and then also, you know, more importantly is is um, you know a way to have fun, and and uh, you know those guys do it, and I know, you know. Last year, Patrick Murray won the trophy because he was, you know, a big-time player for us on special teams, and he had it in his room when I went and checked it out one time. So, um, you know, those guys, those guys are looking forward to fighting for it, and Malkowitz and uh, and Chapman get into it, and even uh, Coach Pace, who's Malkowitz's, because uh, those guys are the two guys on the leaderboard right now, and and uh, Coach Pace, who's Malkowitz's position coach, is trying to argue with me that 
field goal block is a defensive play and not a special teams play, and that's why Chapman shouldn't get the point. So he's railing for his guy, you know, there as well. <laughs> and coach, we have to talk about the arguably the most important play of the game. End of the game, Bucknell's in position to have a go-ahead field goal, and uh, your special teams unit is out there. Why don't you take us through what your thought process is as your team, your squad heads out there? Yeah, you know, it's uh, you're kind of holding holding your breath a little bit, you know, hoping that uh, something big is going to happen. It was a must block situation. You know, there's not going to be any sort of fake, you know, so you really just send everyone. Uh, we got a tremendous push up front from the guys. I mean, you know, you're telling Jordan and Ian, who are our two best jumpers, you know, it, you know, to run and get their feet to the goal to the to the line of scrimmage before they jump up in the air, and that's what's going to give them the best chance to block the kick. So for them to be able to do that, there's got to be great push by the guys up front, and you know, because otherwise they're going to run into the guys you know there. So you know, those D linemen got the push, and and uh, Jordan and Ian you know got up there, and they both jumped pretty good. So um, you know, they get, got their hands up and knocked that thing down. Well, finally, how often do you work on a play like that? It seemed like both Ian and Jordan were about six or seven yards off the line of scrimmage, got a running start, and then it looked like they might as well have climbed a ladder to get up as high as they did and really get an entire forearm on the football. Yeah, I mean, we do, um, we do practice that play quite often. I would say, you know, probably about three or four times a week, you know, um, you know, in practice. And that's one, of our, that's one of our blocks where, especially when teams are going for longer field goals or kicks at the end of the game, um, field goal kickers have a tendency to, to lower the trajectory of the kick and really try to, you know, hit that thing on a line drive, and that's when you have really the best chance to block a kick like that. So when it is a longer field goal or it's one at the end of the game when the kickers get a little bit nervous, uh, that's when they kick those ones low. And, and uh, we got this one this year. And then last year in the Colgate game, I don't know if you remember, but we really blocked one the exact same way. Um, uh, when we, it was an extra point when we really needed it to give ourselves a chance to, to be able to win that game. Well, special teams, certainly a third of the game in this week, seemingly much more. Coach, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me. And now we go inside the huddle with a pair of Fordham juniors who played an instrumental role to Fordham's win over Bucknell. We've got Peter Matzold, who came off the bench and had a huge role at quarterback. And we've got Jordan Chapman, who continues to have a great season at the cornerback position. And let's begin with you, Jordan. It's, it's obviously the talk of the town. We'll look at the play later, but... Take me through what you're thinking as soon as this game ends. Uh, pandemonium, really. Just sheer, sheer, pure emotion from everyone on the team, myself, everyone that was out there on the field just going nuts after that, after that kick was blocked. And as we, we turn to Peter here, I mean, you on the sideline, I'm, I'm sure you're watching the, the play on the field, and it seemed like everyone ran on the field. Where, where did you go? I just want to know that to begin with. I, mean, I was I was walking on the field behind everybody. You know, I, of course, I was you know, you know overwhelmed with joy, but you know also relief. You know because you know what happened a couple plays before with the kneel down. You know could have cost us, and almost did. So it's relieved as well. Now let's talk through what it's like for you to go into this game. It, it's the first quarter, first half rather, and Michael Niebert goes down with a knee injury. Did he say anything to you on his way off the field? And at what point did you know that you would be forced into action? Really. The first significant action since your freshman year. Right, right. Um, well, Michael uh, heard it one series before he came out, um, so he came off to the sideline. He was kind of, you know, kind of worried about it. Doctors were looking at it, and uh, you know, I, so I started warming up, um, and then he went out for another series, and you could tell, you know, you know, he's, he was, uh, it was, it was not good. So he came off, and then, you know, that's when he went to the locker room, and you know, on his way out, he's like, you know, Pete, this is you, you know, it's, you know, this is your time, and uh, you know, he gave me some, some encouragement. Now let's uh, go ahead and turn here to Jordan Chapman. And, and Jordan, you look back at this game, and it seems like you've done a, a very good job all season long in coverage. And in this game, you were asked to really do a lot. You were in man coverage seemingly almost every play. And for you, as you went through this game and you saw that really every point was going to count, did it change your approach at defensive back? Um, not really too much. Uh, before the game, Coach, uh, Coach Blackwell went in. He told he came up to myself and uh, Ian Williams and said, "We're putting you guys on an island, and we're going to need you guys to step up. We're putting nine guys in the box to stop the run, be as physical as possible." So, uh, me and Ian stepped up to the challenge. All right, so let's take a look at one of the first of our highlight plays, and this is maybe the the best play of your career, Pete. I mean, a 63-yard throw to Sam Ajala. Take me through what you're thinking as you release this football. Yeah, well, we we called this play. Uh, you know, we talked about it earlier in the week, going after uh, that safety in particular, actually. Um, get him on a double move. Um, you know, he's about 20 yards back, 
uh, but we knew he was pretty aggressive and gave him a little pump and uh, you know Sam just took over from there and made a few guys look silly and you know in the end zone yeah now in terms of in practice how much do you work with guys like Sam or the first team offense week in and week out uh, well with the with the ones my reps are usually limited to uh, uh, you know, when no one else is on the field, you know, it's just us and the quarterbacks and receivers doing routes on air. Um, when we get into team periods, you know, I'm working with the twos usually. Uh, you know, same routes, same concepts, but, uh, you know, with the players, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's usually just routes on air. So during the week, I mean, for you, what are you doing in terms of seeing a, a game defense? How much do you prep against a Bucknell defense? How much are you working with the scouts? Uh, what are you doing really during the week to prepare yourself for this situation? Uh, well, as a as like a, as a backup quarterback, um, I'm up with the up with the you know regular regular squad, and uh, I get about half the reps as the ones. Um, so my reps are limited, you know, so I got to make them count, um, you know. But in, in the meetings room, in meeting rooms, you know, it's all we're all getting the same coaching, and uh, you know, so getting the mental aspect of that in, in the meetings really helps. So a good week for you, 314 yards, and we turn back to Jordan, and let's take a look at a big play for you. An interception, your third of the season. You were quick to tell me Ian Williams also has three. Is there a contest back there? Uh, yeah, a little bit. There's always a, a rivalry between myself and Ian, just a competitive rivalry between teammates, nothing more than that. Now let's take a look at this play. It's a really a key interception in the course of the game, and, and for you guys, it, turnovers have really been the key all season long. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, our secondary, we, we pride ourselves on being physical and uh, playing as good a coverage as we can. So when, when we have the opportunity to take the ball out of the air, we do as best we can. Now, are you guys thinking about trying to get turnovers going into a game? Is it about scoring defense? What's really the, the motto that you guys try and go to in terms of numbers that maybe you'll look at as soon as the game's over? Uh, numbers really don't matter too much. I mean, uh, before the game, uh, Coach Blackwell and Coach Slutsky, for that matter, uh, both came up to uh, myself and Ian and said we need to win the turnover battle, which is what we try to do every game. And we've been doing that basically all season. So uh, if we can keep that up, it'll be pretty, pretty, pretty good for us for the rest of the season. Now, taking a look into the second half, did you feel like there was a, a need to maybe get a little more, uh, really have a good half as a defense, knowing that the the first team offense was missing to Bucky Jones was missing Michael Niebrick. Did you guys maybe put a little extra pressure on yourself, a little added impetus on you guys? Yeah, a little bit. Um, most of the time, when uh, when the offense is kicking really well, it's re it's really easy for the defense to be playing as well. Um, but if the offense is uh, not on as as much of a high as the defense is, it's it's uh, it's up to us to put put the team on our backs a little bit. But when uh, when Pete came in, we had all the confidence in the world, j just as much as we do in, in uh, Mike Niebrick. So we had. We were, I think we were set. Now let's go ahead and talk here. As we get toward the later stages of the game, you start to get some key drives, Pete. You get a couple of field goals, and you put your team in the lead. What is, what's going through your mind as you're able to move the team down the field, and how effective did you feel in this game? Um, you know, overall, there's too many three and outs. Um, but, you know, we, we, we had drives when we needed them. Uh, you know, it was too bad to come out on the goal line uh, with only a, with only a field goal, um, but you know our, how our defense was playing great. You know, you know we we wanted to get the lead first first and foremost. Um, you know, would have been would have been nice to get get a little more uh, more lead with a touchdown down there in the red zone, but uh, you know we'll have to we'll have to adjust that and make it better. Yeah, well, certainly some things to to think about. But let's go into this final minute and really it all starts. You've got a two point lead. You're trying to take a knee, and really it seems like this situation doesn't hap happen all that much. Take me through it, and was it something they had talked to you about on the sideline? Um, you know, really it wasn't talked about. Um, uh, you know, right before, we, right before I went down to, you know, under center, the ref, you know, ref talking to us, you know, don't do anything stupid. Um, you know, we all want to play next week. You know, it was a great game on both sides, and, you know, you can kind of tell. You, you look over, and they're all they're all down in four point stances. You know, three guys in the a gap. Um, I mean, so you're ready for them to rush. You know, you don't think it's going to be you know just bum rushing or you know center. Uh, you know, you know it happens, and uh, um, you know really, I, I you know I, I need to get a handle on that snap. Um, but uh, I mean, I mean, truth is, I you know I never never really got a handle on it, and uh, you know me and Joe were you know flat on our backs. Um, it's, you know, it's really, really unfortunate that, that happened. Uh, I'll tell you what, though, that we're not we're not going to be taking uh, 
victory under under center anymore. We're going to be uh, in the shotgun taking it well, with safety of some distance. Fair enough. Well, hopefully uh, we'll have another chance to need to use the victory formation before it's all said and done. And now we got to talk about really the, the play that, that ends the game. Blocked field goal. Take me through it. Uh, as soon as uh, the uh, – uh, we uh, lost that that snap. We were right on the field, and we knew we knew it was going to be on the defense's back right up to there. And uh, that last drive, it was kind of disappointing for us as a defense because that most of that game we were in lockdown coverage that whole game, and they had they had a couple of decent decent passes on us. And um, when in uh, in terms of that field goal, they got down and uh, took that knee, and then they almost fumbled it just like uh, just like we did in the the previous series. And um, when the field goal unit came out. I looked at Ian and I was like, "We're not losing this game. There's no way we're losing this game." And um, Coach Carey has done a great job of uh, coaching us up to get our technique down as well as it can be. Um, just jumped up as high as I could, and God willing, blocked that kick. Well, and, and well, you do jump high, as we've come to find out. Well, guys, ten and zero certainly a great point to be, and two juniors really seven wins the first two years. We hope uh, maybe two more here this year and see where that'll take you guys. So. Thanks for uh, letting me inside the huddle. Well, now we get to take a look ahead with Fordham football head coach Joe Moorhead, Mike Watts, Nick Legerfo back with you here. And coach, when you take a look at the week coming forward, the, the Rams are playing a Lafayette squad that really has had an opportunity to make a wave that maybe a lot of people didn't anticipate yeah. at the start of the year. Tough week last week for them. What do you see out of them? Oh, they're a good football team. You know, they're 3-1 they're and one in the league. They have a good three quality Patriot League victories. You know, offensively, they're uh, you know they got the new you know true freshman QB in there who's doing a really good job throwing the ball around for a high percentage of completions and um, you know very good touchdown inter in to interception ratio. Uh, Mark Ross, a receiver, is a phenomenal you know phenomenal player. You know one of the best in the league. Had 10 catches for I think uh, 120 against us last year. Big physical offensive line and Shoreman's a running back and does a good job. So it'll certainly be a challenge for us defensively. And then, um, you know, their defense, it's, it's multiple looks. You know, it's three down, four down. There's pressures from every angle. And uh, Coach Luce has been there for a very long time and has a great tr track record of, of developing excellent defenses. So, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to have our hands full. So you mentioned it, the fact that Lafayette is going to be playing with a true freshman quarterback and that of Drew Reed. And uh, he was a guy that really came alive last week against Colgate, led them almost back in that one. They were down 28 to 10 at halftime, come back 28 to 24, not able to complete the comeback. But what are the challenges that Drew Reed faces to your defense? No, he's he's um, obviously very well coached. You know, to, for them to be able to you know play a true freshman quarterback and put him in situations to be successful, you know, I think that's a credit to Lafayette and their staff. But he's a big kid, strong arm, uh, very accurate. I believe in the, in the Holy Cross game, he had maybe one or two incompletions the entire game. And obviously, with the stable receivers they have led by Ross, you know, that makes his job a little bit easier. So. Um, you know he's he's done a very good job for a true freshman, and, and uh, you know it, it's certainly you know it'll be a difficult task to you know keep him under wraps. Well, when you look at the landscape of the Patriot League, I think there's been more and more quarterbacks, scholarship quarterbacks, that are working their way into the league. Drew Reed, likely another addition of another scholarship quarterback, much like Peter Puyols for Holy Cross that you've seen. Is that maybe a case of where scholarships make uh, the most distinct impact around the league in a year like this? At the quarterback position? Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I'm not certain. You know, I don't, I'm not privy to you know, you know, their depth charts and what they have going on at practice, but certainly Puyos and, and you know, the Lafayette kid are very good players. And you know, we, I think we're just very fortunate at the fact that we have you know, Michael Niebrick, and he's in there playing very well. And you know, he can go down, and you can have Peter step in there and not miss a beat. So. Uh, you know, certainly those kids are very, very talented players and have very bright futures and have done well at, at a position that's, you know, particularly difficult to, to find success at in, in your true freshman year. And switching over to the offensive side, for you guys, what's going to be the biggest challenge facing against this uh, Lafayette defense? No, it's just going to be able to be able to handle all their pressures. Like I said, they, they bring it from all different, you know, angles, you know, combinations of linebackers and defensive backs, just defensive backs, three down front, four down front. You know, they mix a bunch of different coverages in behind it, you know, some man free, you know, a bunch of different zones. So it's very multiple. It's very, you know, you know, in some ways complex for us offensively to, to kind of attack. So, uh, you know, we're going to have to do a great job in preparation to get our guys ready for it.
Lauren, are you worried at all about maybe facing every team's best shot? It seems the best of the way. Colgate has maybe struggled, but they're good in Patriot League play. They're the last game of the season. Lafayette, again, having a much better season than maybe some anticipated. Do you expect, obviously, their best shot playing specifically against you as a team that's perfect going in? Yeah, I mean, if that's the case, that's the case. But at the end of the day, we can't focus on, you know, how people are viewing us. You know, we, we just got to control the things that are under our control, which is how we prepare during the week, how hard we play, and how well we execute. So, uh, you know, Coach Devaney and his staff certainly do a great job with, with their players, and, you know, they're going to have them motivated. And, uh, you know, coming off of a tough loss to Colgate and prior to the Lehigh game, you know, at home on Community Day, you know, it's uh, you know going to be a big game for them, but you know it's a big game for us as well. So I expect it to be a you know very hard fought, hard fought um, contest. And what, finally, just for me, uh, what are your keys to the game? Final keys to the game? Uh, you know, the first, you know, is something that we had been doing well all year up until maybe the last week or week and a half is turnover margin, and you know our our defense has continued to do a good job creating them. You know, we had done a good job protecting the football throughout the season up until the last two games. So. You know, turnover margin, explosive plays, and, and really the big thing is, is third down. So uh, if we can continue to convert third downs the way we have and, and get off the field and then, you know, with the turnovers and um, explosive plays, you know, create them and limit them, I think those will be the keys. Coach, finally for me, at 3.30 start, it's maybe a little bit of a, a different look for you guys. What's your game plan going into the, the Friday and Saturday of this week? Does it change for you, the routine that you, that you go into with this road game? Yeah, it's going to change. But, you know, in terms of our, you know, operation schedule, you know, we, we have a, a preset, you know, schedule that we follow based on the time of the kickoff. So, you know, we'll go in and our, our Friday night meetings will be a little bit less. Uh, we'll get up. You know, we'll have some more special teams and position meetings before pregame meals. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we, we adjust it based on the kickoff time. So it, it shouldn't affect us that much. All right. Well, Coach, thank you very much. Thanks for your assistant coach, Nate Slutsky, and for Jordan Chapman and Peter Matzold, who joined us earlier in the show. For Nick Legerfo, I'm Mike Watts. For our entire WFUV crew and everybody at FordhamSports.com, thanks for watching this edition of Monday Night Quarterback. We'll see you again next week. Monday Night Quarterback is a production of WFUV Sports. Ball on the right hash, second down and five. The receiver to the right moves in motion right to left. Now in the slot, Carter taking the snap, dropping back. He's looking to throw deep. He's looking for Carter at the 10. It's intercepted at the five by Ian Williams. He's got the football. Matzel stands six yards behind Mazzara, the center. Running back on his left, third name from his own 37. Pump fake. Now launches it deep up the field. Ajala makes the catch at the 30. Inside the 20, gets away from another tackle. Angles right into the end zone for a touchdown. Touchdown, Fordham. 63 yards. Say he did spike it. This will be... A 37-yard try for the win to end Fordham's perfect season. The snap is back. The ball is down. It's blocked. It's blocked and recovered by Fordham. The game is over. The most unbelievable finish has occurred at Jack Coffee. Fordham wins 23-21.